Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning into the COVID clinical webinar. This is Mark Rudolph, Chief Experience Officer. We have a really important and fantastic topic and roster of things to discuss, so we will get right into it. Just a real quick housekeeping item. We do encourage your questions, and we'll have a little time for Q&A at the end. Your questions also do drive the content of these webinars, so even if there are ones that we don't get to, please enter them because they do help us for the future. You can go ahead and type the questions in the chat box that's at the bottom of the webinar control panel, and we are recording this, so we will send an email to all of you that have been invited to the, to the webinar. Even if you couldn't attend, you'll be able to listen to it uh, and share it with other team members if you enjoyed it and thought it was valuable. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. John Berkmeyer. Hey there, everybody. Good afternoon. This is John Bruckmeyer. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer at Sound. Thank you so much for joining our webinar, Keeping Clinicians Safe Through the COVID Epidemic. Uh, by now, you're all aware that, that the COVID-19 epidemic is spreading rapidly through the U.S., but also rapidly through Sound. As of two hours ago, we had 217 Sound hospitals that had at least one case. We now have seven hospitals that have at least 50 cases. So as most of you appreciate uh, this, um, you know, this clinical situation is moving fast. Um, as you know, our first overarching goal is, as a physician organization, is to save as many patients as we can and to do the most good that we can. Um, and um, toward that end, I just wanna thank um, all of you for everything that you do every day. But our second, over our, our second overarching goal is to keep you safe because um, unless we take care of you, um, it's hard for us to take care of our patients. And that's a good segue to the uh, topic at hand today. Um, so um, in that context, I'd like to uh, welcome our um, subject matter experts and our chief medical officers uh, for SOUND's three, three primary specialty service lines. Um, Dr. Nate Ruck, chief, chief medical officer for SOUND Emergency Medicine, uh, Greg Johnson, CMO for Sound Hospital Medicine, and Dr. Sergio Zanotti, CMO for Sound Critical Care. Uh, thank you guys for all of your hard work here. Thanks, John. Uh, this is Greg Johnson, uh, CMO of Hospital Medicine for Sound, uh, and just wanted to introduce the agenda for today's meeting. Um, as you can see here, um, we'll go through the introduction, including just a reflection um, on uh, where we are today. Uh, we'll subsequently follow with um, uh, really uh, instructions on PPE use and uh, doing the best with the equipment that we have um, to keep ourselves um, safe as well as uh, making sure that we're acknowledging what we have to do for patients, uh, addressing special situations, and obviously focusing on well being since it's still a critical component of making sure that we are caring for uh, ourselves as we're, we're taking care of patients. Um, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. I want to reinforce what Mark had stated earlier, which is um, type them in the chat box. Uh, Mark will be uh, going through the questions. Uh, if this session times out, um, uh, we will uh, be following up and providing instructions on how you can receive answers to those questions um, after the webinar. So um, in the interest of the introduction, I wanted to uh, also make sure that there was a reflection, something that we do commonly within the organization. Um, and obviously you guys can read a quote. Um, we spend a lot of time in sound discussing um, our core values. And I think in, in light of uh, current circumstances, we, we think about um, uh, adversity quite a bit. Um, and also the quote that um, adversity um, <clears throat> tends to reveal character. Um, and part of the reason that I bring up our core values um, and, and that particular term is that, they, that obviously one of our core values is teamwork um, within the organization and, um, and the fact that uh, what's stated here, keeping coming together at the beginning, keeping together as progress and working together as success. We have so many specific stories uh, that have occurred. What I hear from Sergio daily about our critical care colleagues um, uh, particularly what I hear um, in, in Houston where he's working clinical shifts of um, the fact that uh, our teams uh, that don't necessarily have intensivists, our hospital medicine teams that don't have intensivists that are utilizing 
um, the tools that are coming from uh, webinars like this one to make sure that they're effectively able to care for patients and minimizing risk. And our emergency medicine colleagues who are doing a magnificent job um, that I'm hearing from Nate uh, in terms of just helping to identify appropriate patients, get them um, to the right level of care uh, as quickly as possible. Um, we want to utilize the time in terms of this reflection to also just consider that uh, our teams are beyond um, the people that we typically see every day. Um, we, Sergio, Nate, myself, John Burke, Meyer, Mark, all of us consider ourselves part of your teams. And that's part of the reason why we're delivering this uh, message today. So that way you guys have some valuable information that you can take back to your programs and appropriately apply. We also wanna make sure that we're considerate of our hospital partners, um, despite uh, everything that's going on and, and everybody's concern over making sure that we have the right amount of equipment. We also wanna acknowledge that they're trying to make the best decisions that they can with respect to the availability of equipment that they have. Um, but without further ado, I want to get into uh, the uh, meat of the program, and so I'll turn it over to uh, Sergio. Thank you, Greg. So just, I mean, as as uh, as as John said and and Greg said, I want to first start by thanking everybody for all the hard work. The stories that are coming from the field are amazing. I think uh, not unexpected because I've met many of our teams. And I know that this is an opportunity for them to really create value and serve the communities that we're in. Uh, just to, as a general sound physician's update, like John mentioned, the number of cases continues to increase uh, across all service lines. We will continue, the CMOs, John and Mark, working on the webinar series. A lot of the questions that you write, if they go unanswered, will help us guide future content. We also have a series of specialty specific communications that will continue. And I just want to assure you that the entire organization is focused on the front line and trying to really provide all our clinicians with the best tools possible to really try to make a difference with this pandemic and help our communities. So today's focus will be on clinical guidance on the rational use of personal protective equipment and keep our clinicians safe. And uh, before I even I start, I, I think it's, it's worth uh, remembering that this is a very fluid situation. It's a novel virus. There is an enormous amount of information that is coming in. Uh, not all the information is the same quality. There's a lot of information that also uh, we have learned from previous pandemics of similar coronaviruses. And I think that ultimately, what we need to understand is that this, these are unprecedented times for us as clinicians. Um, there are things that we will need to do probably that we never thought we would have to do. And I think that one of the tools that we can offer our, our clinicians is knowledge. And knowledge really in focusing on what are the things that we control, what are the things that we understand, eliminate noise, and focus on moving things forward and really trying to make a difference. So as we said earlier, the goal here is to create the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. From a community perspective, I think the whole country has embraced, the whole world actually has embraced this concept of flattening the curve by implementing a social distancing and other interventions at a community level. We are hoping that we can manage the surge of cases and that really we don't overwhelm every hospital system in America. As many of you might know, there are hospital systems such as New York that right now are at the brink and really, I mean, are taking an influx of patients that is something that we've never seen. And I think that we're hoping that with all these measures, we can really create the greatest good for the greatest number and get through together as, as a team. So, why is this concept of rational use of personal protective equipment even being mentioned? And I think that it's very important to, to just face reality and acknowledge that there's what we want, there's what we need, and there's what we have. And we, we have to make sure that we can align those as best we can. Now, this whole idea of being rational about the way we use protective equipment, I think is something that has never really been an issue for us because we've never faced a situation like this. We would have one patient that needed isolation and you could get all, all the equipment you needed. But now we're really seeing a lot of patients in a scale that we never thought, and that's overwhelming, not only hospitals in America, but across the world. 
there are three buckets that I think are very important in considering and, and, and constructing a framework for rational use of personal protective equipment or PPE. Number one is understanding COVID-19 transmission, how the virus is transmitted. There's a lot we have learned. There are still things we don't know, but I think that understanding the available evidence helps us as clinicians anchor ourselves on reality and try to prioritize the best way we can with the context that we, we have to live at each one of our programs. Number two is the proper use of PPE based on what we understand of COVID-19 transmission, but also based on the reality of the place that we are in. And I think that the third bucket, which is disruption of supply chains, is something that we have never experienced in the scale that we're experiencing right now. And that disruption of supply chains is really due to many, many, many reasons. Number one, the epidemic started in China, which is where most of these factories uh, uh, reside. A lot of those factories are closed. And number two, it's a pandemic that's affecting the whole world. So never have we seen a surge of need at the same time at such a scale uh, for these type of, of, of PPE. Number three is a uh, massive hysteria, hysteria in the community where people went and bought things that they can't use, don't need, and don't even know how to use, and uh, pr price gouging, and there's a lot of that going on, which ultimately has also obviously impacted the clinicians at the bedside. Having said that, I do think that there are things that we do, we can understand, there are things that we can do, and I would really emphasize that everything I present is based on the best available information and evidence that, 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 that is out there. I rely heavily on WHO, on CDC, on peer-reviewed journals. I think that there's a lot of information on social media that is not actionable data sometimes, but I really think that if you think about this as a clinician, as a scientist, there are some uh, things that you can understand, some things that you can infer, and I think ultimately use a rational approach to guide how we deal with this, because I think that's ultimately the best uh, chance we have to be safe and to protect ourselves and our teams. So what do we know about COVID in terms of transmission? The best, based on the best available evidence, COVID, the, the virus of COVID-19 is transmitted between people through close contact and droplets. And I think that that's a very important concept because everything that we know so far indicates that that is the way that this is transmitted. Now, there's other ways that we will talk in a second uh, that are, are, are potential or plausible, but let's focus on what we do know. We do know that close contact and droplets are the key. And in terms of close contact, what does that really mean? It means being close to somebody in a, in a, in a, in a length of less than six feet or one meter. And in terms of prolonged contact, some uh, healthcare uh, organizations such as the CDC at Singapore define it as 30 minutes of close contact without protection and others such as Hong Kong define it as 15 minutes. But again, this is not, you just walk by somebody and you're gonna get COVID-19. It's related to droplets and close contact. Now, one of the likely ways that this happens is that you get droplets on your hand and then you rub them in your eye, your nose or your mouth and that's an easy way of transmitting the virus. And that, that is why frequent hand washing is perhaps the most powerful tool we have both in the community and at the hospital level to prevent dissemination of this virus. Other community-based strategies or measures that are important are avoid touching your face, your eyes, your mouth, and your nose in particular. Respiratory hygiene in the community, which means if somebody's gonna sneeze or cough, to do it in their elbows, and if they use a napkin or, or a tissue paper, to dispose that tissue paper immediately and wash your hands. Um, the use of medical masks, which are prevalent uh, for the last several months around the world in communities and airports, uh, even in some hospitals, are only indicated for those who have symptoms. And they're indicated for those who have symptoms so that they will decrease the transmission of droplets to others. And finally, the whole idea of social distancing. More and more counties and states are going into quote unquote lockdown, but the whole idea really of people staying home 
people not gathering with other people. And especially, I think, for those who have symptoms or are COVID-19 positive, it's very, very important. So these measures are what I think as a social, um, as a society, public health officials are trying to push through. And we're seeing different measures of this throughout the world. But in one way or the other, the world as we know it today is different. Uh, today, they announced a lockdown in India. It's the largest lockdown in the history of, uh, of humanity. 1.2 billion people in lockdown. And I think it just illustrates to how people are concerned about this virus, but also that these measures actually can impact the number of transmissions. Now, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of concern about fomites and aerosol. And I think it's very important to understand that where this comes from. So all the clinical evidence available so far has indicated that the transmission of COVID-19 virus, the COVID-19 producing virus is through close contact and droplets. There is one a particular uh, research published as a correspondence to the New England Journal of Medicine this, uh, earlier this month, where they, under experimental conditions, were able to show viable virus generated in aerosols and in different types of fomites, such as copper, cardboard, stainless steel, and plastic. So nobody has been able to link this experimental finding to solid clinical evidence that this has caused a transmission of the virus. However, I think that it does bring up the point that that mode of transmission is plausible. In terms of aerosols, what that means is that what are situations that are most likely to generate circumstances similar to the ones that they had in the experiment? They're not a lot, but there are some aerosol generating procedures such as intubation, extubation, bronchoscopy, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, uh, nebulizers, that CPR bagging that might fall in those categories. And you'll see throughout the discussion that that's why we're prioritizing certain types of airborne precautions for those situations. On the other hand, in terms of fomites, there is no clinical evidence that suggests that the fomites are an issue, but we do know that cleaning of our hands and cleaning of surfaces with, with soap, appropriately as we'll talk for hand washing, and with alcohol-based products eliminates the virus. So again, even if fomites are a plausible source of contamination, I think that we do have tools that when applied in a consistent manner can mitigate that risk significantly. Now, in terms of experimental evidence, based on this publication in this paper, you can see that both for aerosols and Cooper, uh, and, sorry, and fomites, there's a plausibility for the virus to remain uh, alive. In terms of epidemiological evidence, it's been hard to prove, but from an airborne perspective, we do have uh, some evidence to suggest that if we prevent droplets, we're in good shape as healthcare providers. But also the other evidence that I think is very important is with over 300,000 positive cases around the world and many more that are untested, um, over and over again, when people have been quarantined, it has not been that they consistently infect everybody in their household. So if you take a good droplet precautions and you have a sick patient with COVID in your home or a positive COVID patient, it doesn't mean that everybody gets sick, which makes me think that if airborne were an important mode of transmission on a regular day-to-day -day basis, it, that would be impossible. The spread of disease would be a, a, a incontainable in, in households because those houses have no way of filtering, filtering the air. So as you can see, there is some epidemiological data that would suggest again that the main mode of transmission is droplets, that fomites and aerosols, other plausible, are much less likely. And furthermore, in the clinical experiments that have looked at either exposure of a healthcare provider workers or in large randomized trials, not with, uh, with this particular virus, but with influenza and other similar respiratory viruses, they have shown that the surgical face mask of droplet precautions uh, serve uh, have the same protection as those with N95 and other respirators. So there is more evidence suggesting that perhaps the aerosol and the fomites are less relevant, but that we should still, because they're plausible, maybe focus on super high risk situations and what are the factors that we have to mitigate that. So 
We talked about community interventions and we talked about social distancing. I am making a very strong urge for everybody in our programs to really start thinking about how do we produce or how do we implement social distancing in the hospital, especially in the ICU, but I'm sure in the ED and also in our hospital teams, we work in groups, we do MDRs. I think we're gonna have to start rethinking how we do that. Wanna keep as much distance as we can because a lot of healthcare provider workers are getting sick around the world from other healthcare provider workers who have symptoms. And I think that that's gonna be very important. So rethink how you do MDRs. Meetings should be virtual as much as possible. If it's a small number of people, maybe with enough distance, it's okay, but start rethinking how we do meetings. Rethink how we socialize at the hospital. I think that we need to support each other, but we have to be smart about things. And maybe after a tough, a tough um, shift, going out for happy hour in the big group is not the best idea. And then I think another issue that I think is very relevant is our work areas and call rooms. I, I have visited many of our programs, and I know a lot of our programs have call rooms where the clinicians and the non and the rest of the team work together. Think about how do I implement not only social distancing there, but how do we clean things appropriately? How do we disinfect computers? How do we disinfect our, 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 our phones? And really start thinking very deliberately about implementing social distancing, not only when we're out of the hospital, but when we're at work. What can we learn about healthcare providers from other experiences? There was a, a very interesting article that was shared by John um, earlier this week uh, by Atul Gawande. And there's also other reports available through WHO and other uh, 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 sources that basically talk about what has happened in different places that have either uh, been through the, the surge of their epidemic or are still in the midst of that, but have had more experience in terms of dealing with this for a longer time. And there's three, I think, that, are, are, that come to, to mind immediately that might give us some clues that might be useful for us to focus on what are the things that we can do that might help. So obviously, as you all know, the first epicenter of the pandemic was in Wuhan, China. In the initial wave at Wuhan, over 1,300 healthcare workers uh, became uh, COVID positive. Now, they really had a big problem with their healthcare um, uh, work, workers force. And at one point, they were able to implement very draconian uh, rules everywhere and were able to, to change the trajectory at other places in China, but they were able to bring in over 40,000 healthcare workers from other places in China to work in Wuhan. Now, these um, had uh, bunny suits, N95s, um, droplet precautions, and they really, I mean, were, were very aggressive in having that for everybody. And it's very interesting that based on what's reported from that second wave of providers, zero got infected. So I think that um, that gives us hope that with the right uh, implementation, we obviously can uh, keep our workforce safe in the hospital. Now, the reality also is that we don't have uh, all those suits, but they mostly did it based on uh, use of N95s and droplet precautions as well. So let's look at other experiences and see what we can learn. The second epicenter of the, um, uh, of, of the pandemic has been in Italy. And as many of you know, Italy has been struggling uh, for the last several weeks, especially in the northern area of the country, in Lombardy, um, with a, really a collapse of the healthcare system. There's been 8% of the infected uh, COVID positive people are healthcare workers. They represent 1% or 2% of the, of the population. So clearly that is an increased risk. Uh, this has not been published, but in a webinar that was presented by WHO late last week, the, uh, the head of the Italian Critical Care Societies was sharing their experience. And one of the things that he was very clear about was that when they have analyzed and looked at their healthcare uh, worker uh, that were positive, they do believe that a lot of people got exposed um, early on, that they did not have droplet precautions, and that a lot of the exposure also may have happened from socialization uh, before and after work, and that the healthcare providers themselves, the workers, were an enormous vector for transmission of, of the disease. So really, I mean, a, a lot of people have had the opportunity to hear these webinars from our Italian colleagues and to participate in some of these calls. Their plea is to be very diligent with PPE 
to, uh, to prioritize, to make sure that people are utilizing it in the, in the right way. And the third uh, experience that I think is actually a shared one from Hong Kong and Singapore, where they had early rises in cases and took very uh, decisive action, it might be more comforting for us in the United States because they did a, a, at, at Singapore, they did utilize a very rational use of PPE in which they really prioritized the N95s for the situations where high aerosols might be produced or for the positive patients. They used droplet precautions in everybody. And they also went further in terms of making sure that standard precautions, such as washing your hands deliberately and using just regular gloves and even a, just a regular face mask for other patient interactions was done as early as possible. And they have shown zero um, healthcare workers infected so far based on their reports. Uh, very interesting also is that based on an exposure, one pneumonia patient in Singapore had exposed 41 healthcare workers of which um, I think 80, 70, 85% of them had only dropped the precautions and only 15% had used at one point uh, N95s. The, all those healthcare workers had had over a course of 14 days double testing and none of them turned positive, suggesting that uh, if we take the right drop of precautions and prioritize the N95s and airborne for the highest risk procedures, we can really keep our, our, uh, our healthcare workers safe. So again, I think that um, this is information that I think is valuable. It doesn't give us all the answers, but I think that it would be foolish not to try to understand what has happened elsewhere as, uh, as this pandemic uh, continues to grow and affect the rest of the world. So let's move on now to uh, talking about what we really consider rational use and how we should be thinking about this based on what we know, based on what we understand, and based on what the WHO and CDC have recommended. So. In an ideal world, we would have all the PPE we want, understand exactly what we need, and not have to worry about it. In a pandemic world, that might not always be possible, or that potentially could be a problem. So the way we optimize PPE availability is we use PPE appropriately, we minimize the need for PPE, and we do the best we can as a hospital, system, as, a hospital as, a, as a group, as a city, as a state, and as a country to coordinate PPE supply chains. And we'll talk about each one of these a little bit more. So in terms of minimizing PPE need, I think that the first thing that we have implemented at Sound Physicians and we're trying to push forward, and there's different ways we can do this, is the use of telemedicine, especially for triaging and for patients who are not as sick. A lot of this can be done through telemedicine. Um, there's been other uh, seminars, uh, webinars from Sound on the application and how to deploy this. Um, the second is physical barriers, and that is very important for uh, our ED colleagues, especially for triage, figuring out ways to triage people who might have COVID-19 so that we don't disseminate or uh, infect uh, all people. And I know that uh, Nate uh, and his team talked about that earlier today in terms of how to use uh, tents and outside triaging for a lot of patients who might not require hospitalization, but that who might still be a positive and, a, a, and, and a spread the disease. The restriction of healthcare workers, I think is very important from entering the room. Think about how to minimize the, the number of times we need to do things. Uh, labs should be drawn at once. Uh, people should be doing certain checks when they're giving medications. Uh, consultants don't need to go into the room. Uh, unless they really are going to examine the patient for a, for something that's going to change management. Um, obviously, at this point, I think most hospitals with trainees and students have limited the number. Uh, visitors is another big, big, big component of that. And I think that a lot of hospitals, depending where they are, are moving to more and more restrictive visitor policies. Uh, obviously, that has uh, may have positive impact in decreasing spread in the community and among healthcare workers. But I think it also has significant impacts on the community in terms of what it means in a time of crisis. And uh, I think it's important for us to think about this because our kindness and compassion are probably not gonna be enough to help everybody that really is gonna need help. But it, it has happened in other places like in Italy when patients are dying by themselves and uh, family members are not there. So just think about 
the toll that this takes not only on us as healthcare workers, but on everybody in the community. Other uh, options to minimize PPE, in some places, depending on the structure of your, your hospital, what's available, what's possible, cohorting might help eventually to minimize the use of PPE. And there's a lot about this uh, in CDC recommendations. Uh, this is not necessarily, I mean, a, a given solution for everybody, but something to think uh, as things progress. And finally, also, how do you deal with non-COVID patients? And in a lot of instances where we would usually use PPE for um, some isolation, some contact isolations, there's also a possibility of uh, prioritizing and making sure that we're minimizing the use of PPE in our situations, which in this pandemic at this given crisis time might be less of a priority. So what about the use of PPE appropriately? And let's talk about this. And this is really, I think, what we really want to get to in terms of rational use of PPE. Um, there are things that we need to do at triage. I, I think that our index of suspicion for COVID-19 as the pandemic progresses in our communities is going to be lower and lower. But anybody with acute respiratory illness of unknown origin who presents with fever or cough or shortness of breath, we definitely can have COVID. I think going further for our ED and hospitalist colleagues, think about common diseases now like a COPD exacerbation, an asthma exacerbation, somebody who has a DKA. Why do these people usually get these? It's because they have something that exacerbated it. One of the most common causes is respiratory illness. So think about that as well. Uh, is this DKA because I started having, I mean, a sore throat and had a fever, uh, or is it just because I didn't take, I ran out of insulin? So all these things are going to be important and have a high index of suspicion. As soon as we suspect somebody being COVID positive, the first thing we can do is implement uh, infection uh, prevention control measures in all suspected patients. And that I think we should be very aggressive because it minimizes the risk of exposure for everybody else. So what are some of the infection control, uh, prevention and control uh, measures that we can implement immediately. So if possible, if you have anybody who you suspect or know has COVID, put a face mask on them, on the patient, that is source control. Um, to all patients that we suspect having COVID or have COVID, apply droplet and contact precautions. And that usually means an, a single room with a droplet and contact precautions. Uh, if possible, for those who are COVID positive or those who might undergo an aerosol generating procedure and suspected of COVID, we would use airborne precautions or negative pressure rooms. Most hospitals, if they have a high influx of patients, will run out of those or can run out of those. So again, the, the CDC recommends is to focus on droplets precautions and contact precautions, but to prioritize the use of airborne precautions for those patients at higher risk. And again, in terms of what we should use as providers, in terms of N95s is again preferred for those patients who are documented positive or those who are high aerosol generating situations and procedures such as intubation, BiPAP, bronchoscopy, and CPR. Now, so far, all the evidence or the, the preponderance of evidence clinically and epidemiologically would suggest that the main mode of transmission is droplets. Because of those experimental findings that can be aerosolized, I think, and because it's a novel pathogen, people have taken the extra precaution uh, in those situations prioritized for airborne. But I also think that we need to recognize that uh, in many places, the reality of running out of airborne rooms is true. So then you have to make decisions based on the best available evidence to try to keep everybody as safe as possible. What about uh, that's what we do for the patient. What about what we do ourselves as healthcare workers? I think the most important uh, thing I can re reiterate both at home and at, at work is the frequent deliberate hand washing. I had opportunity to work clinically recently and uh, it saddened me to see that there are many, many healthcare workers who don't know how to deliberately and effectively wash their hands for a situation like this. So I really think that you should really focus on this. If you're going to use water and, uh, and soap, um, you must make sure that you cover all aspects of your hand. Uh, aspects that are often uh, neglected are in between the fingers, the back of the index finger, the tip of the fingers, the thumbs, and you should be doing this for 20 or more seconds. 
So I think that if you really look at videos that will link in the, in the email and you really start practicing very deliberately, you will see that it, in order to do a very efficient hand washing, it requires you to pay attention. And I think it's important for us to learn that, but more importantly, it's to teach it both at home and to our uh, team uh, co-workers so that everybody can stay safe. If you use alcohol, you still have to cover all those areas and you should be using alcohol-based products with 60% or more alcohol for 20 to 30 seconds and then allow it to dry spontaneously. The second uh, aspect of this is to wear the appropriate personal protective equipment. And I think that this is where we have to be very careful. I think that every time that we utilize something that is not needed, it, it might be something that in the near future we wish we had. And I think that uh, people take comfort in talismans and they believe that the more they have on, the safer they are. But the reality is the way you stay safe is by understanding what each situation requires, understanding how to take every step very seriously and do it the right way, and also understanding that within the context that you might be living at your individual program, there might be times where you have to make some priority decisions and that's best made as a, as a group, as a team for the, whole, for the whole institution. So let's go over this, which I think is very important, the proper order of putting on and removing personal protective equipment. So what do you need for COVID positive patients? Suspected or, or positive COVID patients, you should have a gown, that you put on, you wash your hands first deliberately, then you put on your gown. Then if you're not gonna be in a high aerosolized situation, a face mask is recommended currently by CDC and by, by WHO as being appropriate. Uh, you then put a face mask or goggles, and finally you put on your gloves. You take care of what you need to take care, and when you come out, this is very important, you must wash your hands in between every step. I usually will even wash the gloves with alcohol. And the reason is that that it decreases the likelihood that I'll self-contaminate. I usually remove my gown and gloves together without touching the external part. I wash my hands after that. I remove my face shield or goggles, trying to not touch my face. I wash my hands again. I then remove my mask or my respirator if it was a situation where required aerosol protection. And then I wash my hands again. And I think that doing that in a pause way takes time, but I think it's very important for us to, to take very seriously and to show to other people how to do it. And this is very important if you're in, a, again, if you are in a situation, in, in most hospitals now they're limiting the N95s to COVID positive patients. And eventually that might even be limited for, further to COVID positive or suspected patients in which there's a high risk of aerosol, which would be the intubation, extubation, bronchoscopy. But starting to think about this in a very rational way, I think is the only way that we can optimize the availability for everybody to be as safe as possible. Now, this is a, actually from the WHO, and it was updated a couple of days ago as of late last week. And uh, uh, basically uh, what you can see here is that for healthcare facilities or inpatient facilities, they talk about what you need to do um, in terms of um, PPE for P PPE for healthcare workers who are providing direct care for COVID-19 patients. So if you're not in an aerosol situation, they're recommending medical mask, gown, gloves, and eye protection. If you are in an aerosol generating procedure performed on a COVID-19 patient, they're recommending respirators, which are the N95s in the United States, plus the standard or equivalent, plus the gown, the gloves, the eye protection, and, 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 uh, and the apron. So I think that this is very important for people to understand that droplets is the main way to, to stay safe. And perhaps the most important intervention that we can control is the hand washing and making it at, as deliberate as possible. But as we move forward, we might have to select who gets the, uh, when we use the N95s. And what's very clear from both the WHO and the CDC guidance is that uh, 
when you're not working with patients, you don't need an N95. When you're not working with patients, you don't need to use a mask unless you're using that mask to protect others. And I think it's gonna be something that's very important because that is only something that is used to protect others, not to protect yourself. So just uh, re remember that. And then you can see in triage, laboratory, and other areas, there is other um, include other other recommendations by WHO, which are very much aligned with what CDC is saying right now. So. We talked about how to minimize the use of PPE need. We talked about how to utilize the PPE we have in the best way. Let's talk a little bit about coordination of the PPE supply chain. And here I just have a couple of messages. I think that number one is we need to work with our hospital leadership and understanding what's available, what's not available, what are they worried about, how can we optimize things. I think that sometimes there might be misalignment, but we have to be able to provide them the best information possible. And we, I think, need to understand that divided house cannot succeed in this pandemic. They are doing the best they can, I'm sure, to help us. It goes beyond the hospital C-suite. It goes beyond the hospital system. It goes beyond the state, beyond the country. The, the impact of this pandemic is worldwide, and we're not prepared. And I think that's a reality that we need to understand. So what are the things that we can do to make sure that we utilize what we have in the best possible manner to keep all of us safe? Number two, Sound Physicians is working uh, other avenues to try to secure and help with, with this. And we don't believe that we can solve all the problems, but I think that in as much as we can help the, the teams that are in most need, I think obviously that uh, Rob, uh, John, and Jess believe that this is our, our obligation and we all agree, so we're working on that. Uh, and this is a reality that we must confront. I wish it were different, but it's a reality we must confront. And that's why I think knowledge is power in understanding with what I have, what are the things that would keep me safe? And as you see, based on the evidence, most people want things that they don't really, are not really justified by the evidence, are mostly driven by fear. But if you look at the evidence, we can apply these things the best we can and understand that no matter what, there's always something you can do to mitigate the risk of spread. The last thing I want to talk about is what happens if we do everything to optimize and we still have a, a, a crisis period where we really get into trouble. So our hope is that as we move forward and things are activated, this won't be a problem in every hospital in America. But I do believe that based on what we're hearing from New York and what has happened in other places, it could very well be a problem in, in hospitals that we have. So I think you need to understand how to think about this. There are conventional capacity strategies, which means that it's business as usual, and you would just do whatever's recommended. And I think that that's where people were operating some months ago. There are contingent capacity strategies, which now means that we still have what we need, but we are worried that if we don't take care of it, we might run out. And I think a lot of hospitals are implementing procedures and protocols for that. Um, usually this means that we would do things that we normally wouldn't do. So for example, in many hospitals, they are restricting the number of N95s to prioritizing to COVID positive patients or to patients who have high aerosols. You might reutilize an N95 uh, the same day. In other places, you might use them for a little bit longer uh, if you are in a place where people are cohorted. So these are things that um, are done in order to try to preserve N95s and are obviously less than the ideal situation, which is you use it and you, you throw it away, but they're done under the circumstances to provide the greatest amount of protection to our, to our healthcare workers. And then there's also a crisis or alternate strategies, which is when you're actually very close or running out. And uh, there's also recommendations from, from, the, from the CDC in this respect. And the idea is that if you are rational about how you deal with a crisis, the hope is that you can go back to a conventional capacity strategy or a contingent capacity strategy as soon as possible. And we're hoping with everything that's going on, that will be the case if it happens to anybody. So in terms of, uh, of what do we do if we run out, just some thoughts. Obviously, what we're trying to do is prioritize the use of PPE. So prioritize based on risk. Risk in terms of aerosol producing patient, not aerosolized producing situation. 
that's a big differentiator. If they're not aerosolized and you don't have enough N95s, you use regular face masks and face shields. And based on the available evidence, that is going to offer you protection. Prioritize based on need. So in terms of where are the areas that you might have more of this and, and uh, high risk procedures and make sure that that's where, where the N95s go. Um, there's also alternatives to N95s. A lot of people have asked me about uh, the PAPRs or the powered airway uh, uh, suits, uh, reserves. These are actually, we, we're, we're trying to get them in a lot of hospitals. They're hard to, to use. You can't really use it all day long. I mean, it's kind of hard, but if you're in an area that's cohorted, that might work. But also try to use those in a judicious way for those high risk procedures and then clean them again and use them again, I think is very important. But um, they don't, they also offer difficulties in terms that we don't have them for everybody. They also can increase cross-contamination uh, and they require training. So I think something to think about for the highest risk procedures. And there's other alternatives that the, 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 the local authorities, state authorities and governments are looking into. Another um, thing that I think is very important is in some situations, cohorting patients when you get to the situations and a lot of places, I mean, utilizing the same PPE for, for more than one patient if they're all COVID positive, obviously. That is something that has happened in, in ICUs and in hospitals that have been really uh, overrun with the number of patients. And uh, the other thing I always think is important is to focus on steps that are, are available. So even if you didn't have N95s, but you could control your hand washing, do appropriate droplets, source control on the patient, minimize the time you spend with the patient, and minimize the time others spend with the patient, these are all things that will mitigate your risk. So always focus on what you can do, which is always something that, that, can, that can be done that, that is effective in mitigating the risk. And lastly is that as soon as you restore your supply, obviously returning to the best practice when supplies are available. So these are things that I think are, are hard to sometimes listen, but I think that understanding how to best approach them are, are a much more powerful weapon than anxiety in terms of making sure that we all get through this in the as best possible. This is an example uh, from the CDC statement on crisis alternate strategies and just showing you that no matter what the situation is, there are things that you can do in terms of keeping the distance from the patients. If you have to be close and it's not a situation where a respirator is needed, if you can cover the patient and cover yourself with face masks, that is uh, that that itself, I mean, is very important and can reduce risk. Also, considering the use of other alternatives other than N95s for those high-risk procedures, there's a, what's called elastomeric, a PAPRs, a based on availability. So a lot of hospitals are working to secure those as well, but those are not usually something that you can buy by the thousands. So I think it would be prioritized again for the highest risk uh, interventions and procedures. Finally, want to talk about some special situations for healthcare workers. I know that I've received and Greg and Nate a lot of questions about this. Uh, I wish I had definitive answers, but let me share with you what uh, WHO and CDC have shared, what's posted. Number one is healthcare workers who are positive for COVID-19. Obviously, those patients, th th those healthcare workers uh, should be uh, quarantined. Um, there's different procedures uh, that are going to be driven by state uh, local authorities. I think that this is different from somebody who got an exposure. So with exposure, initially people are being quarantined, but now without symptoms and self and self monitoring, a lot of those are allowed to come back to work with masks. With positive tests or symptoms, the initial um, uh, guidance is for them to stay home so they don't infect other coworkers. Depending on what's going on in the situation, like in Italy, obviously, uh, there's a very, very different situation that might change, but just be aware of what is going on from CDC and speak with your local uh, health authorities. Pregnant patients in general, there's a lot of questions about this. There is no data available uh, as of now that suggests or that demonstrates that pregnant patients are, are at a higher risk of contracting the disease or at a higher risk if they contract the disease of having worse outcomes. As you might remember, some of you who were through the previous pandemic, which was the H1N1 pandemic, that virus had a particular preference of, or, or uh, had a particular uh, impact on pregnant patients. And there were a lot of reported 
very severe ARDS cases in pregnant patients. We have not seen that, but the truth is that we do not know. So if this is a concern for a pregnant um, healthcare worker, they should talk with their clinician, they should talk with their um, their supervisor, and there's maybe things that can be done to mitigate this, but as of now, the CDC is, uh, a, is recommending that this be evaluated individually. In terms of immunosuppressed patients, I think that there are um, obviously a wide range of definitions of immunosuppression. I do believe that if you talk with uh, transplant surgeons and cancer and, and doctors, oncologists, uh, uh, categories of severe immunosuppression that would include recipients of transplants who are in active immunosuppression, uh, physicians getting active chemotherapy, and, uh, and maybe physicians or, or healthcare workers who are being treated with immunomodulation therapy for rheumatoid disease or for rheumatological disease would probably fall in a, in a special category. And those patients, uh, those healthcare workers should talk with their uh, physicians, but also with their directors about their, their concerns. With that, I will turn it over to Nate Ruck, our CMO for emergency medicine. Thanks, Sergio. I love your facts and not fear approach to facing the challenges uh, regarding PPE. And, you know, as we band together as healthcare workers and, you know, as a country to face this challenge, caring for ourselves is really critical. And I want to just take a few minutes to outline some of what Sound has to offer on that front. And some of these resources come from within our organization and others come from outside. Headspace is a, a meditation app which you can download onto your phone. They've generously decided to make their subscription product free to healthcare workers. As long as you have an NPI number, you'll get the product free for the duration of 2020. Our very own uh, Tammy White is uh, live broadcasting a uh, the power of self-care yoga via Zoom, and that's on Thursdays from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Peer support, absolutely essential. You know, this there's a culture of kind of stoicism in healthcare, and sometimes people who need the most help won't show it, and it's, it's critical that we have each other's back as we navigate this. Our employee assistance program, you can find details if you go to the next slide for me, Sergio. We've put together a new uh, well-being webpage, which aggregates all of our resources, uh, some from within Sound and many from outside our organization. And this is a great place to go so you can find out um, you know, what we have to offer uh, to make the challenging work we're all facing easier and more tolerable. We've also made some changes you know, last year we broadened the scope of our CME program to support, you know, activities related to well-being, whether it's, you know, a yoga class or a massage. And, and now we've further expanded that program to include up to $500 of personal clinical gear, which includes, you know, PPE, scrubs, stethoscopes, clogs, uh, et cetera. You can go to the next slide, Sergio. Now, We've also curated a list of resources. I don't think anyone is wanting for more information on COVID-19. It's really everywhere you turn, but there's a couple of resources that are worth mentioning. The WHO and the CDC, you know, I, I think are great places to look for policy questions, for directions. They have a, a great section on the CDC website on PPE uh, sparing strategies in the event you face shortage and and you know, really dovetail with a lot of the techniques Sergio discussed in his content. The Puget Sound has really been uh, on the forefront of this pandemic in the United States and are certainly several weeks ahead of most of the rest of the country. The University of Washington has uh, graciously opened a lot of their normally internally facing content to the world and they've aggregated those resources on a resource page which you can find at the at the URL underneath that link and our very own uh, Dr. Sergio Zanotti hosts Critical Matters podcast which has had a couple of episodes dedicated uh, solely to COVID-19 and is a must listen for anyone in the in the clinical front line. Thank you, Nate. 
We have a, a significant number of questions, and I want to um, I want to thank you guys for the presentation, and I want to thank everyone for the questions and acknowledge that we're not going to get through them all. However, we will try to come up with a way to answer these after the fact because there's a lot of actionable questions. There also are a number of people who are sharing their thoughts and frustrations around the situation. I just want to acknowledge how challenging and and scary this situation is. And so. Um, a couple of things that there are multiple questions about that I'm going to start with. One, somebody asked about the, the CME policy and the, the quote additional $500. I just want to be clear that it's you can use $500 of your existing CME allowance, not additional. Another question that there are multiples of is what is Sound's policy around clinicians who get ill and can't work? So we don't have a singular policy around that. It really depends on the circumstances. In fact, somebody asked, what if they get so ill that they can't ever work again? So, you know, Sound as an employer is prepared to handle situations like that and support our people, but there's no one answer. If you have a question about a specific scenario, I would encourage you to reach out to HR at soundphysicians.com and ask them about that, and they can give you information, or you can speak with your supervisor about something that may be going on with you personally. Um, next question, specifically about PPE. A number of people said, okay, if push comes to shove and I have to make masks at home, is there anything in particular I should use to do that? So I think that in terms of the, the mask at home, uh, the important thing to know is that the surgical mask uh, are mostly for droplet precautions, so you don't have any special filters or anything like that. I think that also think of using even like they recommended bandana and scarves, but I would actually put that on the patient first as opposed to on myself because if you have a cloth mask all the time, that might be a problem. But there's ways of protecting from droplets that I think are are, are low are low tech and can be can be utilized if come if the need comes. We're hoping that with being very uh, deliberate about how we use things, uh, supply chains will be restocked and that will be in good shape. But obviously, these are all things that I think are, are, are worthwhile considering and focusing on what we do know and what we can control. Okay, thanks. What, a question about quarantining. Are our healthcare workers who have had an exposure to a COVID-19 patient, but who themselves are asymptomatic, are they advised to stay home for 14-day quarantine? So the initial guidance from CDC uh, when this started was that, and that was initial guidance in many places. What has happened in many healthcare systems uh, abroad and in the United States is that uh, all of a sudden you have 90 people quarantined, they're all sitting home and they're all feeling fine. And the seroconversion of a lot of these patients, a lot of these people has been very, very low. So I think that you should talk with your local hospital, talk with the, the local health authority who should be involved, but the idea is, and I know in many places on the, in the West Coast, if you were exposed, had a high risk exposure, uh, and you are asymptomatic, you are allowed to come back to work with self-monitoring. If you had a low risk, uh, um, a low risk exposure, then you're allowed to come back to work. So I think that it depends on the situation. But the idea is that if you're exposed, uh, in most places as the need comes, they're allowing people to come back to work with self-monitoring for fever and other symptoms. I'd like to expand on that. Um, one of the other considerations is that, um, again, reinforce what Sergio is saying, but we're also identifying the opportunity to use telemedicine. Um, so that way individuals can continue essentially seeing patients, um, even if they are quarantined based on their hospitals rules, but they, they still feel that they want to be able to um, help out uh, in terms of addressing the existing patient volume. So I'd reinforce, speak to your uh, supervisor or your regional medical director, because I think that there are alternative ways to approach it. Um, but, but first and foremost, check with your hospital. Greg, since you mentioned telemedicine, there actually are a number of questions that are asking whether or not we should be changing a lot of our patient encounters to virtual. 
via telemedicine, FaceTime, how, however that may be, just to limit the number of close contacts that people are having with these patients. So I, I think this is also consistent with what Sergio uh, suggested in terms of being um, judicious and prudent with the use of PPE. Um, if there are patients um, that, uh, and we're trying to limit our uh, specific exposure, um, the telemedicine option, um, and I, I'm calling it telemedicine, although it doesn't meet the strict definition, um, but utilizing FaceTime, Skype, um, Messenger, other uh, forms of that is uh, possible. Um, there has been a memo that has been uh, distributed. It's now, uh, it should be accessible on Sound Connect for our hospital medicine and critical care colleagues. Uh, it's also on Pulse. Um, and there are emails that have been sent out to all of our chiefs, um, uh, as well as our clinical leadership, um, to help provide specific direction on how to not only utilize uh, uh, the in-house tele option, um, but also to make sure that it's appropriately documented. Okay, thanks. A question about inpatients who have had a negative test. When should the test be repeated if the patient is still under investigation? So I think that if the patient is still under investigation and the thought is that the patient is either still very suspicious, clinically not getting better, the the recommended uh, repeating is in a, in, a, in a period greater than 24 hours. Um, obviously, as testing becomes more prevalent in the United States, uh, we'll probably have more information on that. But I think that the the most important point to drive home is that if you have somebody who clinically is behaving like COVID and you do a test and it's negative, it doesn't mean that they don't have COVID. And I think that that is really kind of the clinical principle that should guide, I mean, uh, the, the need to repeat the test, but don't repeat it maybe immediately, but give it at least 24, 48 hours before you, you repeat it. Okay. We talked about pregnant patients, but are there any specific guide, guidelines right now or, or guidance for clinicians who are 65 or older? Uh, no, I think that the reality is that uh, we do know that on an average, patients uh, who are older and uh, uh, who have more comorbidities are seem to have a higher likelihood of severe disease. But based on the experience here in the United States and what we've seen in other places, uh, young people can also have very severe disease. So there's no really specific guidance on that right now. Okay. And I, this is going to be our last question. I may ask John Berkmeyer to, to address this um, in relation to PPE. The question is, are, are we sending out PPE to all of our sound sites for providers, especially masks, uh, as some clinicians are being told that they cannot get them. I'll take the question since I'm not sure that John is on and I, and I don't want us to get cut okay. off. Um, the answer sure. is, yeah, the answer is we are going to be taking these case by case. Um, and in terms of people raising their hands about um, that, obviously, uh, Sound isn't a supply and logistics company, um, and there uh, are um, a lot of questions that will have to get answered. Um, I know we don't even know exactly how much, uh, how many masks we're going to be able to procure, but I know that we're actively working on it, and then we'll be providing some level of guidelines to the um, uh, service line and uh, regional leadership in order to um, provide some guidance. So. We want to make sure that we're aware. We're also making sure to communicate to our hospital partners that this is to help and um, uh, not to replace uh, their responsibility in terms of providing additional PPE um, to our folks. Okay, thanks, Greg. I, I'll just um, I, I want to add just one thing, which is that in addition to you know the challenges of distributing this stuff, Sound does not necessarily have some inside track to a supply that that is out there. And in fact, one of the things that um, I'm hearing from different parts of the country is concern about potentially counterfeit and or other kinds of scams related to masks and that sort of thing. So. You know, we're trying to um, get our hands on 
uh, the effective materials and uh, make sure that you know we can help those of our programs who are most challenged in this situation. Um, I want to just remind everybody about the COVID-19 at soundphysicians.com email address, which we are looking at all the time and we'll answer your questions specifically if you send those to us. We will make an effort to address all of the specific questions that were included in the chat box today for the webinar. And um, Sergio, Nate, Greg, any closing comments? So I think that what I would ask our clinicians is to um, don't obsess over the N95 when most of the time the current evidence suggests that you will be protected with other steps. Obsess about social distancing, obsess about hand washing, obsess about source control, obsess about what are the steps that we can do every single time that will, I think, make a difference. And it's the mastering of those simple procedures that ultimately I think gives us incremental uh, return on our investment and that really will protect us through this. And I think that um, it's going to be hard. It'd be harder in some places, but I think as, as a team and supporting each other, we'll definitely get through this. Thank you guys for the Bye. awesome presentation. Oh, Nate, go ahead. Nate, Greg. My only comment was just reiterating the thanks. Um, we appreciate the questions. Please keep them coming. Again, information is power. Um, thank you, and uh, and um, I won't take any, up any additional time. Thanks, Mark. Okay, I thanks, just everybody, to... for tuning in. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Nate. <laughs> well, I just wanted to close by saying that, you know, this content is for you. So if there's something you want to hear or if there's, you know, a topic you want covered, make sure to give us feedback so that we can make it better. And uh, be sure to tune into the, the specialty specific webinars that are happening later in the week. You'll see e emails about those, those uh, invitations. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks for the great work that you're doing, and we'll talk to you soon.